I think it's verse 16. All right, so we're continuing in our um, series. This is a, a, a broader uh, justification series that started in 2020. And we had a subsection here called Christ's Meritorious Obedience in Justification. Meritorious having to do with His merit. And we are on part seven of that. And I've uh, been trying to subtitle these. Um, problem is sometimes the parts of them blend from one to the other. Last week we looked at impeccability. This week we're going to try to get to, hopefully we'll get to uh, his sufferings. Christ's meritorious obedience in justification, part seven, his sufferings. Now last week we, we looked at the second part of uh, the impeccability of Christ, which was the subject of uh, the fact of Scripture that teaches that Christ could not sin because of who He was in His person with two natures, both God and man. It was an impossibility for Him to sin because of His, his makeup as a person. Uh, we spent quite a, you know, two parts on that. So We also saw that... Um, so let me back up a little bit. So we're, we're looking at Christ's law obedience in his life as part of what makes up the merit of righteousness that's imputed to his people for justification. <clears throat> there, was a, there's a, there is some controversy about not that Christ obeyed or didn't obey. They all believe he obeyed the law, but why did he obey the law? Was it as a private person to prove himself an acceptable sacrifice? Or was it a representative uh, law obedience for his people uh, as part of the work to establish righteousness. And we're defending the latter here. And we saw uh, several things. I'm not going to wear out a review. I, I'm always tempted to re-preach uh, all the messages I've preached before, uh, but we don't have time to do that. But we talked about how that in John 17, I think it was around verse 5 or 6, when he's praying is uh, what's been called his high priestly prayer, right before they took him to be crucified, he said to the Father, he said, I finished the work that, that you'd have me do. And so we kind of asked, well, what was that work? What, what had he had done so far? We'd already spent a lot of time talking about all these verses that talked about him fulfilling the law and keeping the law and, you know, we talked about how he was the only one to do something with the law effective because we can't. And so I think it's pretty clear that um, part of the work that was done before the work of the cross, which is when this prayer was prayed in John 17, that that work had value. It meant something. It, it, was, it was part of the merit that goes into establishing a righteousness for his people. So some might say, well, you know, he said, I come in the volume of, uh, of the book to do your will, which includes fulfilling all those pro Old Testament prophecies, signs and miracles. Um, Scott, you're not saying he did signs and miracles and the merit of that's imputed to you for righteousness. No, I'm not saying that. Uh, it's not signs and miracles. He was getting ready to go do the biggest miracle, right? And then as far as signs, he said, there's only one sign given, the sign of Jonas. And he was getting ready to show that at the cross, right? And that's the greatest sign and the greatest miracle is, is how that this one could come down from heaven, take on flesh, be born under the law, take on sin, put sin away, and on the other side of that, remain clean so that God can be both a just God and a Savior. Magnifying all his attributes, showing that um, he does this in a, in a just, equitable way. Uh, no cheating. No play acting. And so on. Now, we've talked about some heresies along the way that some would say about Christ, uh, both his person and his work. But we know <clears throat> you've heard of the word of faith preachers. Um, Kenneth Copeland and, and the like. Um, 
what's the one, uh, Joyce Meyer, people like that, they have this idea, <clears throat> and what's weird is there's some Sovereign Grace Calvinist, Calvinist Reformed people that are not far from what they're saying, but Christ's nature, they say, was uh, affected when he took on sin that he became a sinner and that his, his nature was affected or in some way maybe even you could say infected. And he uh, had to go to hell. All those texts where it talks about hell, they don't tra translate it as grave. They mean like he actually went to hell. Some of them talk about, you know, whatever, fighting with Satan, arm wrestling, whatever he did with Satan, and, you know, had to be punished down there by Satan. All these convoluted ideas, but he had to be born again, they said. Now, we know he had to be resurrected because he actually did die, but that has nothing to do with, with what they're talking about. So they said he had to be born again, which, you know, he didn't have that nature that we had from Adam that needed that. There was no spiritual death in him. The only death that he participated in was, first of all, legal death, imputation of sin, and the legal declaration of condemnation and guilt because of the sin of his people, and then physical death. And of course, we know he resurrected from that. So here's the question. Okay, we know he didn't need to be born again. That's pretty easy. Did he need to be justified? And if we say that, what sense did he need to be justified? Well, let's, let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to be looking at a lot of different texts today. We're going to be bouncing around. And if you don't feel like turning to them, uh, and maybe like the one-liners, I'll just go ahead and quote, but ones that are maybe a lot more verses, I'll ask you to turn to them, and, and you would probably want to. 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest or made known in the flesh. Here we go. Justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among nations, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And we talked, I think it was last week and the week before, that, that he came down from heaven. We talked about the... Uh, condescension, the, the coming down, the stooping down, uh, and, and um, setting aside his reputation and his rights to display himself as blatantly who he is. And, to, uh, and we said, you know, how we would do, we would be killing people right and left. You know, this is God's humility in Christ coming down and taking... We talked about dish it out, can't take kind of people. He was taking these things, and we're going to see some more of that in his humility, how that he, uh, and we quoted some already about turning his cheek and, and, and taking the abuse of sinful man, and we'll be looking more at that. But he was received up into glory where he came down from. We're also going to be talking about his exaltation and uh, how that... Through his humility, he uh, there was a sense in which he earned that exaltation. That was part of the agreement. That was part of the covenant in humbling himself. So justified in the spirit. There's this idea of vindication. There's that sense when we talk about justification. Also, we know this, that Christ did have sin on him. And it was removed by his own work. And he put away that sin. And we know about the resurrection, which is tied to this whole idea of vindication or justification in that sense. Of course, we know Christ didn't need a justification like we do. I mean, he's the one that's providing the work for our justification. So it can't be in that sense. That would be in the category of the word of faith heresy that he needed to be born again. So there's not that. But he did for real have sin on him. It says, uh, I can't remember the the chapter in Hebrews, but it talks about him coming back a second time without sin. Well, we know in and of his person, we, we went over the impeccability that in and of himself, he was the spotless, harmless, holy, undefiled, and separate from sinners and all that. But he's going to come back the second time without sin in reference to he, he doesn't have our sin on him. He put it away. 
And so there is that sense in which we could, we could look at the vindication or the justification of Christ. If he, if he failed, we know, we know here's another thing. We know the idea of the resurrection shows the Father accepted the sacrifice. If Christ failed, in other words, here we go. If Christ died for all and one was not saved, much less the Armenian view where the majority is not saved, Christ would be rotting in the grave right now. He would not be worthy to be raised. So we're going to talk, we're blending all kinds of things here today, some ideas. Let's go to Isaiah uh, 50. <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to kind of look at a few things about this idea of vindication or justification, uh, which is tied to the resurrection and exaltation, which is tied to our justification as far as we can look at and we can have confidence and assurance in because, hey, he's raised. What did it say in Romans 8? Uh, who can lay anything to, to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justified. Yea, Ray the Christ, Christ died. What, go on further. He raised. Where's he at now? He's exalted. Uh, looked like a pretty successful uh, mission of accomplishment. Isaiah 50 and verse 4. The Lord God gave me the tongue of the learned. Now this me here is Christ speaking. That I should know how to speak a word in a season to him that is weary. He wakens morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear. And notice this, I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. So he came to do the Father's will. He agreed to in the eternal covenant of grace, and he's going to go through with it. And look at this, here's his humility. I gave, verse 6, I gave my, I gave, notice, voluntarily. This is an active thing he's doing. We're going to get into later some more about this um, active and passive. I don't even like the passive idea. I believe it was all active. I think he was fully engaged. He knew what he was doing. I don't think there's any need to use some kind of a passive language in his work. Uh, I understand the system, how they lay it out, but I don't like the language. I think it weakens the work of Christ when you uh, just in reference to, to reverence in your mind when you look at the work of Christ. I gave my back to the smiters, and what else did he give? My cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Remember, they plucked out his beard. I, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. What would we do, or maybe we have, some of us, if somebody spit in your face? I mean, that, that, that's kind of a high-level thing. I think I'd rather be like unaware and not ready and get smacked in the face than get spit in the face. Here he took all that. He took the spitting. He didn't hide his face from the shame and the spitting. Verse 7, For the Lord will help me, therefore shall I not be ashamed. Therefore I have, notice this, this is a, if you've heard this from the Gospels, I can't remember which, how many Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I can't remember, but there's a statement in there where he says that he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem where he was going to die. And here he says, Have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifies me. There's the idea. That's what we're talking about. God will justify Christ in vindicating him and raising him from the dead for his accomplished perf perfect sacrifice in having sin on him and then having sin removed by his own work. Is this a mir I mean, this is the miracle right here. People want to see these, go to these churches and people, you know, rolling in the aisles and speaking some kind of gibberish, like that's some kind of a sign. And they only know about this. 
This is what's going on right here. This is the important thing. He is near that justifies me. Who will contend with me? Like after that, it's a done deal. You know, the Father approves it. It really doesn't matter what anybody else says. And we can say the same thing. And that's why this is done by Him first, so that who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? The answer is nobody. You know, God doesn't even lay anything to the charge of God's elect. Not that He wants to. This is what's honoring to Him. This was the purpose and the plan. He puts us in the state of justification by imputed righteousness and under the non-imputation of sin. Sin will never, ever be charged again to God's people. And what if it was? Well, God would be unfaithful to His own promise and His own character. And... Um, Justice would be maligned, and you know, there'd be all kinds of questions about many of his attributes. And so we can look at false religion where we see that their gods, small g, messed up on this work, and we can see, well, this is just idolatry. This is, and you know, God points this out in his own word. He mocks idols, and we should too. Not necessarily the people that believe them, because we used to believe them too but the doctrine and the false gods. There are false Christs, Scripture says. So we need to point them out and show the differences, show the distinctions. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Behold, the Lord will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Kind of matches what's going on in Romans 8 when it talks about us. So if he succeeded... This is what this is about. We know that he won the battle, therefore we're going to be fine. right? This is where we can rest. Lo, they shall wear out like a garment. The moth shall eat them up. So the accusers, they, they're not going to have any space to talk. Go to Romans 4. <clears throat> Romans 4 and verse 13. You know, as we, it just seems like every week, um, we see encouraging things in the scriptures of not just promises, the fulfillment of the purpose of God. We know who this God is and how that there is, um, uh, these promises are sure and certain based on who he is, what he's promised to do the ability to do them, and so on. Every week, we just seems like there's all this pylon language that, that I hope you guys are catching that so it bolsters our assurance in the God that we serve and love. Uh, Romans 4.13 For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Because if they which are of the law be heirs of the law, in other words, if you are getting your inheritance by doing the law, trying to do the law, of course we know that would be for righteousness. We know that's the curse. We know that nobody can do it. If it was done that way, then faith is made void it says, and the promise made of none effect. Well, we know that's not going to happen. God follows through with his promises and he sets everything up so that these other things don't affect or cancel out the promise. And we're going to see here in a minute that it's, uh, you know, by grace through faith. Verse 15, because, and this is why, because the law works wrath. Man under the law What's the best he's going to get? What's his wages? Sin, death, wrath, guilt, condemnation, and so on. Uh, we've already seen man has a law problem because of his flesh, because of who he is by nature, and by practice. <clears throat> because a law works wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Well, we know... We, we covered all early on in this, this seven-part series, 
we covered a lot of different aspects of different laws, going back even as far as, as Adam breaking that first law. And that's enough. That counted for everybody as violators. Then the conscience was received by everybody right after that. That law of the conscience is broken. And then later we have the law of Moses and on and on and on. We have commands and so on after that. So the law works wrath. Verse 16, Therefore, here's the conclusion, it is of faith so that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. That, that's a mouthful right there, that first part of that first half of that sentence. You see security, you see assurance, you see that this is not going to be fouled up. It's based on pretty much everything outside of ourself, even this faith. I mean, this we don't conjure up this faith. Faith's a gift. Again, it's not an offer. It's a gift that he works in his people. Look at the second half of that sentence. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of of us all. As it is written in the Old Testament previously, I have made you a father of many nations before him who he believed, even God. This is the one we're talking about. Remember how we always catch that language and it says something and as a comment says, even God. That's who we're talking about to begin with, right? It's just redundancy of language. What about it? What's being said here? God who does what? Who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. So man, let me just stop there just for a second, just make a few comments about that. We know, for example, in creation of the world, God created the world out of nothing. He spoke it into existence, right? Um, and we could maybe venture into talking about maybe a previous chaotic earth that was recreated, you know. We don't have time for that, but there's a creation there, which I believe the creation pictures the new creation. I think that's the main story of the creation of the world. We know that the world was created so Christ could come and die. Christ must die in the eternal purpose of God, therefore Adam must fall. you got to have a world for sin to come into the world and Adam fall and so on to get this thing started according to the purpose of God, and nothing's going to stop that. Well, just as God created the world out of nothing, the new creation, I mean, it starts out with we have a negative problem. We're in Adam. We're under law. We're under condemnation. We're under wrath. We, we need salvation completely of the Lord. So here comes God with the new creation. He imputes righteousness, regenerates, gives faith and repentance. So he creates, he's the creator of the new creation, the new creature, God's people, which is righteousness and holiness, it says in Ephesians 4. I think it's verse 25. Um, I think it says true righteousness and holiness, not fake righteousness and holiness. We've emphasized that in that text. So that is, that is God um, calling those things which be not as though they were. Well, now they are when he does it. The reality of imputation, which is effectual, he's not play acting. Uh, when he imputes righteousness and declares one just, it, it, it's on a basis. You know, it's backed up by something. It's not like our American money system that's just computer strokes and you got a piece of paper that's worthless. It used to be backed up by gold. I mean, this right here, this currency, the blood of Christ that we're redeemed by, is the backing concerning this righteousness established. That's why the question is asked, who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Nobody. It's God that justifies. Verse 18, who against hope referring to Abraham, who against hope believed in hope. Now, yes, this is this word hope that we always emphasize that we 
I try to always look up when I see hope because it's not always this word, but this is the word here that means confident expectation. Which, again, this is just pylon language, right? The confident expectation of what? Something to do with us that we're doing? Of course not. What We've got no confidence in the flesh. How can we? We have confidence in Him alone. Who against hope believed in hope that He might become the Father of many nations according to that which was spoken. There's some means there. God's always using means according to that which was spoken. Of course, this is tied to promises. And don't forget when we talked about earlier about creation, what did He do? He spoke it into existence, right? According to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. And being not weak in faith, why is that? Because God gave him the faith. He didn't create his own faith. He considered not his own body now dead, but he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He was, she was not far behind in age, which Scripture said she was barren. She wasn't going to have any more kids. But this was uh, the hope coming from the promise that Abraham believed. Notice in verse 20 what it says, He staggered not. He did not stagger at the promise of God through unbelief. He didn't do that. But was strong in faith, giving God glory. And notice, being fully persuaded. Does that have anything to do with assurance? Have anything to do with a confident expectation? Being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Now look, just, I mean, there's a message in and of itself. The vast majority of false religion has a God who is not sovereign, nor powerful, nor wise, nor just, nor holy but it's not sovereign and and can't get anything done unless you help him out or give him permission. The language here, um, you know, is, is kind of pregnant with power and sovereignty, the ability to accomplish what he has purpose to do and even said he's going to do. And God given faith that that God gave faith to Abraham receives that promise, understands that promise. Verse 22, And therefore it was imputed to him, Abraham, for righteousness. So that it here is really the object of Abraham's faith. Not faith itself. Faith itself has no value or merit. It's not a condition. Faith is not the righteousness, but the object of faith, the Lord our righteousness, the one who established righteousness. So when we have Christ's righteousness, that is is what brings all these spiritual blessings to us by the power of God. It is like the floodgates are released, and this is what, what we've been waiting for, our need, our first need, that Adam messed up when Adam was legally condemned. The day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Legal declaration of guilt and condemnation. That was transferred to us legally. That's our first problem. That's the, the ground of total depravity. The fruit of that is spiritual corruption or spiritual death. We need help with both. And when God corrects this problem that Adam screwed up, and he corrects it through the Lord Jesus Christ, the impeccable one, there is no doubt that there is a righteousness there based on the person of Christ. So his his merit, his earnings, his, his gift that he created and gave to his people through the means of imputing it to them, crediting it to their account, They're declared righteous. Now, look at verse 23. Now it is not written for his sake alone, as we read that in Genesis. It's not just for, that's just for Abraham. No, it's not. 
Here it says it's not. Not for his sake alone that it is imputed, but also for us also. And then look, it gives some future tense language here too to maybe those that have not yet believed who are God's chosen people to whom it shall be imputed. Future tense. We know that it has been in the Old Testament, even when Paul wrote this, even Abraham had Christ's righteousness in the Old Testament imputed to him, and he was justified. Scripture's clear. So we see that there is uh, the imputation of righteousness in each generation to God's people, and um, each one is justified in each successive generation as time goes on. Based on the ground, the work of Christ establishing righteousness so that it can be imputed. Verse, to, okay, in the middle of verse 24, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up our Lord from the dead. So faith is the evidence that. Christ died for you, and that you have His righteousness. Faith is not the cause, but it's the evidence. And again, this faith is not something laying around that you pick up and utilize, and you're the catalyst. You know, it's not synergism. It's not your cooperation. It's God. John 6 is clear on that, somewhere around verse 27 or whatever. This is the work of God that you believe. You'll still get arguments for, from people, you know. God's not going to believe for you. God's not going to repent for for you. All right, keep yapping. Notice that latter part there. Raised up our Lord from the dead. Now we know uh, we we've looked at several ideas throughout. The scripture about how the Trinity, different persons of the Trinity do different things. And sometimes there's a layering of that. Christ said, I lay down my life, I'll, I'll take it up again, right? Um, here it says um, that someone else raised him. And then we see uh, another text about the Spirit. We see this too when it comes to quickening. We know the Holy Spirit quickens. There's some other spots where it talks about Christ quickening. Sometimes we'll see some overlap in the Trinity when it comes to the economy of the Trinity and different things going on. But I know one thing's for certain. He's raised. He's raised. Notice verse 25 here. Who was delivered for our offenses. He's talking to believers here. And was raised again for our justification. So there's a vindication here. You know, there is a there is a successful sacrifice and there is a raising up because of that. And that secured all that we have in him. And this again too is in a sense Christ's justification because if he would have failed he would not have been vindicated and would he, he would have remained in the grave. So he has to be raised so that we can be raised. Go back up to verse 5. Some people, the only reason I'm going up here is some people say, well, it's faith that's imputed. Faith is imputed, which I, I, I kind of never did understand. Uh, like, how can that even be? Uh, when we talk about imputed righteousness or imputed sin, we know this is uh, imputed sin is the imputation of a demerit. Imputed righteousness is the, the imputation of merit, the value of Christ's work as he established righteousness, and that's given through imputation. But faith uh, would be more along the lines of being imparted, uh, given to or or even put in. God does work in faith. He creates faith in the heart. So anyway, I, I came here to kind of show something here. Look at verse 5. To him not working, but believing on him, 
who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, we know that faith doesn't take the place of righteousness. We know that faith is not the righteousness. We don't have faith in our faith. We know faith is not a condition. You know, faith didn't die on a cross. Neither did repentance. We know faith and repentance is not even a condition for forgiveness. And we can go, we beat this thing to death seven ways a Sunday so we can see that this salvation is not conditional. Notice this. Even at verse 6, even as David also says of the blessedness of the man, notice, to whom God imputes righteousness without works. This is the idea here. I mean, some people just flat out deny that righteousness is imputed. And, you know, I can see why some people would, would battle to twist this to get out of what this is saying. I mean, there's several different parties and several different heresies of people squirming trying to make this not righteousness imputed and try to explain it away. Verse 7, saying, Blessed are, the, are those whose lawlessnesses, uh, iniquities in King James, are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. There's the state, the fixed position and state of the non-imputation of sin. Sin can never, ever be charged again once one is justified. There is therefore, what? Now, no condemnation to them that are in Christ. Philippians 2. We, we looked at this, I think, uh, last couple of weeks. You don't have to turn if you want. You probably have it memorized by now. Verse 9 this is talking about, again, his condescension down in humility. Verse 9, therefore, and this is after that, this is really what he was awarded because of his humility. Therefore, because of his humility, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of heavenly ones, of earthly ones, of ones under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Remember we talked about God's overarching purpose is to glorify himself in the death of Christ? There's a proof text right there. Now what if he didn't do all that he agreed to do in the covenant? He'd be in the grave. He wouldn't, have, he wouldn't have been vindicated. And then who would be saved? Nobody, right? Ephesians 1, similar language here. So, you know, same vein of thought here. Ephesians 1 and verse 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us, the ones believing according to the working of, of his mighty strength. Now, we've already talked about how some people want to take faith and pervert it. Well, here's a, here's a text that, that guards against that, that ensures that this is not the case. This shows here that faith is a work of God. And it's emphasizing God's power, notice, to believers toward us, the ones believing According to what? This is, goes back and highlights some of his attributes. According to the working of his mighty strength. And here's, he's going to equate the type of strength that it took, that he's showing, that it took to work in us in a mighty way. The self-same power, notice, which, it, which he worked in Christ and raising him from the dead, all right, so free willers talk about their ability to work up faith by their own free will. Free offer people, well men offer people, say that God present, and these are sovereign grace, Calvinist, reformed people, out of their minds, they're, they're, they present this doctrine that says, all right, here we are, and, and God offers it. Now, 
there's a reception of it. It's like, here's faith. Do you want it? Faith doesn't work that way. Faith is worked in, and after it happens, it's too late. <laughs> uh, it's part of irresistible grace. This is a powerful work of God, and it describes it right here. Which he worked in Christ and raising him from the dead. Not just that, notice. And he seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies. What's that look like? Verse 21, far above all principality and authority and power and dominion, and every name being named, not in this world, and, and the word is, is, is eons, I believe it's ages in some of the other verses, not just in this age. You could even say world, too, as far as the globe. I don't care because it qualifies. But it's talking about age as far as like time. Not only in this age, but also in the coming age. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. That's God's people. Uh, that's who he shed his blood for, it says. Ephesians 5, I believe it is. And then it defines what the church is. To the church, 23, which is his body, his church body. What, what else is it called? His temple. That's his dwelling place. The fullness of him who fills all in all. Just more language that just it's piled on. Go to Acts chapter 2. Here in Acts, it, it quotes some Old Testament stuff. It repeats and quotes some Old Testament stuff. This is uh, uh, some of the early church here, uh, some, some actual sermon parts. that are recorded. I hope people aren't silly enough to think all the sermons of the apostles are recorded in Acts because I know one time Paul preached for a few hours and the dude fell out of the top story and broke his neck. Probably that sermon was longer than the whole book of Acts. So not everything's recorded. So it's kind of weird when we press, you know, the, the, the fact that the gospel has proper, as defined by the apostles, proper doctrine and theology and they say, you're requiring too much. Look at the book of Acts. Not everything's recorded in the book of Acts as far as all the sermons. So that, that would just be silly to even say that. But here's part of one. And this is some good stuff. Verse 23. This one, capital O in my version, Christ, this one given to you uh, by the predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands crucified him, you put him to death. So here are the apostles preaching. He's calling out these, these people that had a long tradition of killing the prophets and so on. He said, hey, you were involved in this. You took him and killed him. Uh, notice verse 24, speaking to Christ, whom God raised up, having loosened the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it, by death. It was impossible for him to be held by death. In other words, he raised. There was nothing stopping him from raising. Why? I mean, you keep going back, cause and effect. We've been talking about it for seven weeks and, and, and many years before that. All these things connected to this one, this unique one, who is both God and man, who's impeccable in both natures, who was born under the law without sin and accomplished this work. He did something with the law perfectly, not just on the surface, not just like people looking at him, but inwardly in his mind, his will, his intent, his motive was pure. And then he took on the penalty of the law. He obeyed it in its precept. Then he took on the penalty. And then he became legally guilty and condemned. And he had to pay for that. He was liable for the sin of his people. And then he died. And because he did that perfectly, God raised him up. The grave could not hold him because he accomplished that mission of a perfect sacrifice. 
Verse 25, for David speaks concerning him, I foresaw, I foresaw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad and also my flesh shall rest in hope because you will not leave my soul in hell in the grave nor will you allow your Holy One, that's Christ, to see corruption. If you're in the grave, you're going to corrupt. But the grave couldn't hold him. He's not going to corrupt. Because why? He did the sacrifice right. The promise was that do the sacrifice right, you're going to not suffer corruption. <coughs> so you see the cycle of coming down, doing the work, being killed, being brought back up and ascended and exalted and is in the highest position of anybody that ever can be in this world or any world to come because of this accomplished work. Verse 28, you revealed to me the ways of life. You will fill me with joy with your countenance. Men and brothers, it is permitted to say to you with plainness as to the patriarch David, he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, speaking of David, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the first fruits of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Seeing this beforehand, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in the grave or in hell, in the grave, that's what it's talking about, to corrupt, in other words. Nor would his flesh see corruption. God raised this Jesus, which you are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this which you now see and hear. So this was... This was the special power of the Spirit, and this just happened right before this, uh, this sermon here of what's going on uh, for the early church. Verse 34, for David has not ascended into the... This, in other words, it's not talking about David. It's talking about Christ is the point. David has not ascended into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit on my right hand until I make your enemies as a footstool to your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that, notice this, God made this same Christ, the Christ we're talking about, who you crucified. What did God make him? Both Lord and Christ. So much for make Jesus the Lord of your life, right? God made this Christ, this, this Jesus, Christ and Lord. Christ referring to uh, the anointed one, the Messiah, who was the sent one of God to do the will of the Father, and Lord, the Lord our righteousness. So this Lordship here spoken of, it's not this silly stuff that some of these uh, lordshippers talk about. This is, this is a lordship of mediation. Christ, his mediatorial lordship, he as mediator, how that he came and established righteousness. And he became known as the Lord our righteousness, which was spoken of in the Old Testament, which the Old Testament saints had, and they were in union with the Lord, their righteousness in times past. They look forward, we look back. So as we talk about righteousness, I'm going to just insert this and remind us, this, this righteousness that Christ established by his doing and dying displayed the righteousness that is his, in his own essence, his character attribute of essence of righteousness. God does not impute his character attribute to us because it's his character attribute. He, he, does, he doesn't impute attributes. Christ worked out this righteousness. He brought in an everlasting righteousness 
as a gift to be given to his people by legal transfer, uh, transfer, imputation, and crediting to the account of. So here's the point about this righteousness that we talk about, that we get. As we said earlier, quoting part of Romans 4, how did he cause these things uh, into play that, that weren't there and that, that are not really there but are now? They don't seem, you know, to natural man, they don't seem like they're there. Um, God calls it as he sees it. How does God see it? He sees it the way he works it, right? And we see it by faith. So God says righteous. Everybody in the whole world says, no, no way. <laughs> and God says, who shall lay anything in the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifies. I know what righteousness is when I see it, God says, and it's based on a certain ground, and we've been talking about it here the accomplished work of Christ. So that that righteousness that's given to us was not there before it was there. Christ established it. The Old Testament saints actually got it before it was established. God's able. That also refers to what it's talking about in, in that verse, talking about the way God calls things to be. So a lot of people, even some Reformed Calvinist Sovereign Grace people, have this problem of righteousness being the merit of a work. And that's what's imputed. They have all kinds of different ideas of what's imputed, whether it be a character attribute, whether it be faith, whether it be all these other things. Um, but we've been dealing with this for years and years and years, and we're kind of scrunching it down here the last few a uh, few weeks and looking at it a little bit closer. Now, we've been asserting Christ's law-keeping, that it was substitutionary. Uh, in other words, used sometimes vicarious. It just means in the place of substitutionary. Representative, his law-keeping, he kept it as a representative. Uh, this was part of his mediation. He did this as a go-between between him and God. So now we're going to start, and I'm already in almost an hour. We're going to have to cut this off pretty soon. But I started wanting to drift into the sufferings of Christ. We're going to start looking at his sufferings. What about his sufferings? Is there any value or merit in his suffering? Were his sufferings substitutionary, vicarious, representative, and did he do it as a mediator? These sufferings. Well, we know that, for one thing, at least at the cross, he was under wrath. He was under God's wrath for the sins of his people. And we know there were sufferings involved there for a space of three hours on the tree before he died. We know that his life, there were sufferings. But it seems to culminate and focus on this crucifixion, the sacrifice, that there were sufferings there. And so we're going to be asking, and of course this is tied to the penalty of the law, the law broken by God's people. And we know that he was made sin by imputation, imputing the sins of his sheep to him. And so there were sufferings there. Does that count? Do those sufferings count from the time he mounted the cross when God turned out the light? He, there was an eclipse from what I understand. God dealt with Christ personally. Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. The Father was actively involved in bruising the Son. In other words, pouring out his wrath, that cup of wrath that was talked about. Christ drank that cup of wrath during the space of three hours. There was suffering involved. Is there any merit to that suffering? What does that suffering count for? I think it's obvious that they're there, and we'll, we'll be looking at some stuff as time goes on. We're about out of time, but uh, the suffering was not for nothing. It had value. Notice that uh, you should know this readily in your mind that he finished the work of fulfilling the precept of the law. He already said that in John 17. And then in paying the penalty of the law, he satisfied the law. What is that? That's that act of what's called propitiation, satisfaction 
of God's wrath because of the broken law. And we know this, that Christ even said those final words, it is finished, actually before he died. So if we say it is just the death, that's all that matters is his death. Well, sufferings led up to his death. The wrath of God was involved in uh, meeting out justice up until his death in the space of those three hours. That counted as value, and that is part of the merit of the work. What's the deal there? That means we don't have to suffer. God's people don't have to suffer in hell. Christ paid their hell in the space of those three hours. So God's people won't have to suffer hell. Um, they'll be resurrected, right? Because Christ was resurrected. Christ was justified or vindicated by the successful work and His resurrection and His ascension, His exaltation. So there's value in His suffering. He finished the work and then He died. He said He got the power to lay it down and take it up again. That's what He did. God was in Christ, and it's a famous verse there, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. Who is that world? It's the same world in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Who did He love? He loved His elect. What about the rest? Clearly says He hates. I mean, we've worn out messages saying that God hates the elect and proved that over and over again. But this is the same world, and, and we know that in in. Second Thessalonians or Second Corinthians five nineteen because it says not imputing their trespasses unto them because they're imputed to Christ, right? So we know that he was God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. That was that action of of propitiation, satisfying God's law and justice, and absorbing that wrath, turning the wrath away, which of course results in reconciliation. And that, once and for all time, secured that righteousness that he established, and it's imputed to each generation, which it already had been in the Old Testament. And of course, we now, again, there's therefore now no condemnation. I had a bunch of stuff in Romans 8. That's the next verse I was going to look at, but I'm going to stop. This thing, when you <laughs> when you start unpacking it, it just like starts growing, and you can't hardly keep up. Like, where do I go now? It's giant, and it's a giant grace party. You're a party with grace. <laughs> Any comments or questions before we sing a song?